thanks for coming to my little talk about Spring Data JDBC. Um, and, um, well, who does use Spring Data? So that are many, but not everybody. Who does use Spring Data JPA? Okay, that are most of the ones before. And who does like JPA? Wow, that is even worse than I thought it would be. Okay, so I guess you are in the right talk. Um, but since there are some people that don't use Spring Data, um, a real quick introduction into, into Spring Data. Um, the idea behind Spring Data is to have a consistent API for various <laughs> persistent stores. Um, relational databases exist um, or have a, their module with Spring Data JPA for a long time. There's MongoDB, there's Redis, there's Cassandra, there are many, many more. Um, and by consistent interface, uh, we mean not that you like can swap out one uh, store for another, because that would obviously be kind of stupid, because they have like very different strengths. And uh, if you create an interface that serves all of them, it had to be really weird and really minimal. You won't uh, want to do that. But what we try to achieve is that, let's say you work with Spring Data MongoDB for a long time, and now you have to work with Redis, and you use Spring Data Redis. And you're supposed to like understand how the things work and can concentrate on two things, your business problems and how does Redis actually work, or whatever store you uh, use next. So um, we now released, on last Friday, the first uh, general available version of Spring Data JDBC. And before talking a lot about it, let's take a look. I'm now going to try some live coding, which is um, going to be painful, at least for me. I hope not that painful for you. Um, we start with a, with a normal Maven project. It's a little cluttered in here because that's actually the project for the whole presentation, so it has a lot of ASCII doctor stuff in there. Um, the interesting part is really that um, we are using Spring Boot in the version 2.0 Milestein 4, so that is, uh, was just released on Monday because it includes the, the boot support for Spring Data JDBC and which we obviously use down here. Then if we want to access a database and don't want to go back to like the early uh, years of the century, um, we need an entity. Oh. This is my entity. It looks trivially simple. Um, the only like special requirement that it has is um, this ID annotation. And with, as with all annotations, you might see, although they might look similar to the stuff that you know from JPA, these are not JPA annotations. These are annotations from Spring Data. So they come from Oxpring Framework Data or something. Um, if you have anything in your import that start, starts with Java X persistence, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, and then I have just a couple of fields, uh, a number, a string, a date, and an enum, so that we have something to play around with. So next thing is um, that you do with um, Spring Data is to create a repository. Most of you already know how that works. Um, for those that don't, um, we create our customer repository interface. And really, all we need to do is to extend one of the um, predefined interfaces, which in this case is the CRUD repository which has all kinds of well, CRUD methods in there, like save and find and delete. And we need to tell it 
um, what kind of entity it is responsible for. So that would be customer, and it needs to know the type of ID we are using. And that's it. I think the first time I used Spring Data a couple of years ago, um, I was really confused and somewhat impressed by that. So now we can use it, and um, as every good developer, I start using it in a test. Um, it's going to be using Spring, obviously. So I run it with a Spring runner. And in order to like, let Spring Data do the, its magic and create these repositories, I just need a single annotation, which is data JDBC test. It will realize that I have a, um, a database in my dependency, in this case an in-memory database, and it will set up a data source for that and it will also set up two more things that Spring Data JDBC needs. One is a transaction manager. Well, technically, I don't need that, but if you want to work with a database, you probably want to have transactions. So it's a good idea to have that. And the other thing is um, Spring Data JDBC uses uh, behind the theme, uh, uh, behind the curtain, it uses a name parameter JDBC template so that gets created as well from the data source. And now we can auto wire, auto wire a customer repository. Give it a name. And for now, just create a empty test to see if our setup works. Run that. And it does seem to work. Great. So using that is going to be really straightforward. We create a customer. Um, we set some attributes. We turn off our phones, and um, we save it. And let's run that. And it works. Hallelujah. Um, and it actually does something. It performs an insert. And um, if you don't trust me or trust the log, I mean, I could have faked that. I guess I could have faked everything I do here. Um, but I don't, promised. So the customer now has an ID, which it got from the database. Um, because we have a schema SQL file, which um, defines the customer table. And the ID, uh, the ID column is an identity column. So it creates an ID. And Spring Data JDBC gets that back, plugs it in the customer, and we can use it. Um, Over here, I, uh, we return a customer. And in the current setup, it actually returns the exactly same instance that I put in in the first place. So it strictly would be um, superfluous in this case. But in other cases, when the ID is final and you just have a wither, so something that looks like a setter but starts with with ID um, and returns a new customer, with the ID set, um, you would actually, uh, we would actually use that 
and return the new instance. So I guess it's a good idea to always return the, uh, use the return value. So I guess that was all uh, straightforward. To recap, um, you need the Spring Boot Starter Data JDBC. Uh, you need aggregate routes. I'm going to comment on that thing a little more in detail. Um, with an ID, so we can identify different uh, aggregates. And you don't need getters and setters. You can use them if you want to, um, but you don't have to. Um, and as mentioned, you can use uh, final uh, values if you have withers, which you might uh, create with Lombok or similar. It also should work with Kotlin, although I have to admit I never tried, but since this is uh, stuff that is coming from Spring Data Commons, um, I'm pretty uh, sure that it will work. So we now have Spring Data JDBC, but why? Why a new solution to a problem that is already solved, right? We have already Spring Data JPA. And JPA, well, not everybody loved it, obviously. But um, it works in many, many applications. Uh, thousands of uh, developers use it every day. Um, why do we think we need something else? Um, the problem with JPA is it is really great but it comes with some serious complexity. And the complexity comes from the fact that it tries to do a lot of stuff. A couple of examples. Um, who has ever seen a lazy loading exception? Yeah. It's um, the, the fact that um, you don't really know by just looking at the code, or at least most developers, I guess, don't really know when will an SQL statement get executed can be uh, kind of irritating, um, reflected in, uh, in tons of Stack Overflow questions. Um, then there's dirty checking. The fact that if you load an entity with an entity manager and then you manipulate it, you don't have to call persist to save it. It will get saved once you close the entity manager. That is cool, right? In, in many um, situations, that is exactly what you want. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you change an entity, and then for some reason or another, you decide you don't want to save that. But you do want to save all the other stuff that now is in your entity manager and is dirty. So now you have to pluck out the entity from the entity manager to prevent it from saving. And that is a little weird. It's like going to a shop where you want to buy a bagel and you go to the cashier and you don't tell him, like, I want a bagel. You tell him, I don't want crisp, I don't want water, I don't want juice, and all this stuff that you don't want. Um, so that he finally ends up like, okay, here's your bagel. It's, it's kind of the wrong way around, right? Another, another challenge that comes up is the concept of the session and first level cache. I mean, it's cool. When you uh, request an entity from JPA um, with a given class and a given ID, and you do that, do that two times or three times or 20 times, you always get back the same instance. But that gets really annoying when you have a modified entity and want to compare to the current state in the database. You can't easily do that. You either, again, have to eject um, your entity from the entity manager or open a new entity manager, which again is not impossible to do, but it's just confusing. This kind of stuff should be easy, right? And in order to facilitate all this, um, JPA um, uses proxies for entities. And I guess it's kind of weird to have a Spring developer complain about proxies. Um, I guess Spring is kind of infamous for proxies and the stack traces created by them. Um, but I think it's a big difference if you create a proxy for a bean that you have like typically one bean per each kind and don't really care about what actually type it is um, compared to entities where you uh, do much more work with, which um, um, wander through your application and have effects uh, all over the place. 
And then finally, um, I've never seen that publicly stated, but just if you look at JPA, it seems they try to, like whatever database you have, whatever uh, schema um, somebody dreamed up, and whatever object model you have, as long as there's like a field for every, uh, in the database for every attribute in your Java model, it tries to map it to each other. And that is cool if you need that and if you want that, but it really makes mapping sometimes really, really complex. I work for JPA or with JPA a lot, and if I look at a non-trivial mapping of like an M to N relationship with a parent and whatnot in these annotations, I don't really understand what is going on and I actually have to try it. I can't predict it. And um, I'm afraid it's even worse for many other people. So we came up uh, over the time with some design choices for Spring Data JDBC. The first and most important choice was at the very beginning, it has to be simple. Because, well, if we want it or not, we are going to, guess, compete in one way or the other with JPA and get compared to JPA. Um, but basically, for most of the time, I'm the developer of this thing, and I'm working for, on it for like a year. Compare that to things like Hibernate, which exists for a decade uh, with sometimes uh, many more developers. There's no way I can create something as complex and handle it as Hibernate. So it has to be simple. And the first thing um, that I decided on is there will be no lazy loading. We have an entity, and if you ask the repository to get an entity from the database, you will get a complete entity. Everything that is in that entity will get loaded. If you don't want that, don't ask the repository for that. Or ask it for a more slim version of an entity, which should be possible. There's also no caching. There are caching solutions out there um, from Spring and otherwise, and you can combine it with Spring Data JDBC, but inside Spring Data JDBC, there's no caching. If you don't want to, to hit the database, don't access your repository. There are also no proxies. Um, my boss, Oliver Gierke, you have seen it probably um, at the keynote, um, he kind of is skeptical, uh, skeptical about this one, if I can keep it up. Um, but so far, I haven't seen any reason to drop it. And I think it's uh, a value um, to have no proxies in entities. And similar as there's no lazy loading, there's no deferred flushing. If you call repository safe, we will trigger SQL statements and persist your stuff in the database. Which, for example, also means you can immediately query it if you're in the same transaction. And just in general, um, we try to keep it very simple, um, thereby limited. There are some, some constraints which will make up uh, a large part of this talk, um, which we are not going to change. And I'm curious if you actually like them or if you're going to hate them and turn back to JPA, which I guess is OK. And um, therefore, we have to be opinionated um, in what we do. And just again, because it's so important, simplicity is king. And when, when doing this stuff, when looking, uh, talking with people that like, do you have this feature, do you have that feature, it's really tempting to like, oh, that so sounds cool, I want to do that. And then when you start implementing it, you kind of often get a feeling what this, um, what this requires. And I've uh, had one situation actually pretty much a year ago where I like worked almost a month on something and then decided that's not going to work. Even if I can get, to, get it to work now, it will cause so much work in the future, um, I'm not going to deal with it. And that's actually the middle and major part of this talk about. So let's see just two small things. Um, actually in action. There's, um, I actually uh, stumbled 
across a talk by Vladimir Alkea. Um, who doesn't know Vladimir Alkea? Okay, everybody who works with JPA needs to know Vladimir Alkea. Follow him on Twitter, read his book. He's a really great guy and he's really knowledgeable about JPA in general and especially Hibernate. Um, and he has a blog article about how to clone an entity. Like, you have an entity in your database and you want one that is almost exactly the same. How do you do that with JPA? And it turns out it is um, kind of involved. But how, how do you think this really should work? Any opinions on that? I think, listen, make a select, load it, and then change it, right. So I'm not even doing a select because I already have an entity here that I just saved. And all I do is I set the ID to null because if the ID is null, Spring Data JDBC is going to assume this is a new entity and save it again. Give it a new ID, done. And while this is not, maybe not surprising for a simple ID, uh, for a simple entity like that, it does work when this thing has references and stuff as well. A different thing is, I already mentioned that, um, if I load an entity, and load it again. These two are not the same. You get a new instance. SQL statements get uh, executed again. As you can also see in the logs, you, uh, the first save the second save triggers an insert, and then the two finds triggered select statements. So really, um, while an implicit cache might be, might be nice because you don't have to think about uh, how often you actually access an entity, this way um, makes it much easier to understand, which I think is the more important stuff. So, you can clone entities by setting the ID to null and saving it again. And um, if you load stuff twice, you get it twice. Um, but my uncle used a saying, I don't know if it's uh, actually a saying in, uh, in the US, but he used to say, nothing is for free except death, and that costs you your life. So what is the price that we have to pay? It comes into play if we look at more complex aggregates. And I keep like a little mixing up entities and aggregates. Um, so let's clarify what we are talking about. Um, actually, no. Uh, that keeps happening when you are changing the slides until the last moment. So. Let's take a look if we have actually a more complex entity. Throw this stuff away and change our customer. Um, make it a little less simple by adding a map of addresses. 
she put an address in here and An address in this example is just a city, and I'm aware that I think Washington DC is not a city, right? But I'm not going to care about that right now. So if I now save the customer with a address or multiple addresses in there, um, the addresses get saved with the customer together. Similar as you would get it with um, JPA if you have a, have a cascade persist or what I guess everybody's using um, cascade all. And also, if after saving it, I now delete it again. It also does delete all the addresses, which I guess is OK for this example, right? I mean, one could imagine that maintaining the addresses separately from the customers, um, but that would just lead to weird effects if, like, I share the same address as some other customer and I move. And suddenly, this other customer moves as well because I changed the one address that both are referencing. Um, so in this case, that is OK. But um, what about other cases? Let's say books and authors. A book has many authors, or at least one, possibly many. And uh, maybe in your domain, if a book goes out of sale, you want to delete the book. You probably don't want to delete the author, right? But Spring Data JDBC will do exactly that, which is weird. You don't want that, right? The answer is Spring Data JDBC doesn't really do many to X relations. And um, when I realized that I had to do that, which was like one year ago. Um, I was like, you can't possibly do that. They will, they will shoot you. Um, but I'm in the US, like, there's like weapon controls outside there. <laughs> and the answer, why, but by now, I think it's actually a good idea. And the answer is in, in the aggregates. Like, there's a, a real popular uh, question on Stack Overflow. Um, I have the, all these entities, and um, like, do I have to create repositories for each and every entity? And the answer is no. You don't cre create a repository per entity. You create a repository for an aggregate, which, of course, brings us to the question, what is an aggregate? An aggregate is a concept from domain-driven design, and it's a cluster of objects that belong together like the customer and its addresses. These addresses alone don't really exist. They don't have any meaning. Even clearer, maybe a purchase order with its items. You don't use the item on its own. You always use it as one thing. And one thing that um, domain-driven design says about such aggregates is, they get persisted together and loaded together, which is exactly what I just said what Spring Data JDBC does with its aggregates. If you load, put something in there and tell it, save it, it will save the complete thing immediately. And if you say load it, it will load it completely. And in every aggregate, there's an aggregate root, which is one of its objects which kind of represents the whole thing. In a purchase order, it would be the purchase order class, which um, represents the whole thing. And that is the thing that you pass to a repository and that references all the internal stuff. And nothing else 
is allowed to actually reference the internal stuff. So what I just did with the addresses, have them in a map and just basically hand out the map to the public, you shouldn't do that with aggregates. That was just because I'm really slow in typing and don't want you to suffer through me typing a whole method with doing it properly. So now, if you look with this background and many to x relationships, you realize they always have to be relationships that go across aggregates. Because if many things are uh, referencing one thing, that can't be the internal of any aggregate, right? It has to be another aggregate root. But if it's a different aggregate root, it's not the responsibility of this repository to load or save it. And that brings up the question, like, how does Spring Data JDBC um, decide what is part of an aggregate and what is not part of an aggregate? I mean, if you come from JPA and are used to, to the way things are done with JPA, you probably can't tell that from your code, right? In Spring Data JDBC, it's really trivially simple. If it's referenced from the aggregate root, it's part of the aggregate. So it's not a many-to-n relationship, but always a one-to-one -one or one-to-many relationship. And so I have the constraint that I can use in implementing Spring Data JDBC. But of course, in your, in your data model, you have these M-to-M relationships, right? You have to handle them somewhere, somehow. And the answer is exactly what domain-driven designs tells you. Just use IDs. Reference them by their IDs not by actually object references. I understand that this is um, not so much fun, but I think it has benefits. But let's look, let's take a look how that actually might work with actually the example of books and authors. I have a book um, which has the usual ID and a title, so it has something in there. And it has a set of authors, or actually, they are not authors, they are author references. <coughs> and if like, I want to add an author to a book, I have this method, which extracts the ID from the author, um, creates an author ref from it, and puts that in the map, and that is what gets stored in the database. In the database, this looks probably as you would create your database anyway. So there's nothing um, necessarily special in there. You have a book table, you have an author table, and you have the m to n relationship table in there. So on the database side, nothing has to change. But your model will probably look different than you're used to it. Who does like that? Ah, I thought so. So doing it this way has some effects. One, not on the sliders, my work gets easier. Um, but it also has good effects for your applications. It forces you to think about aggregates, and it forces you to make these, these borders between aggregates, really obvious in your code. Um, you have many choices how to model that in your database. I mean, I have a simple model without foreign keys. You can have foreign keys between those. No problem with that. But um, once you start thinking about aggregates, you have many options. You might decide to use deferred foreign keys. Um, that is, foreign keys that only get controlled once you issue a commit statement. And um, that might be beneficial for performance, but it might also be interesting for testing. Um, who has written integration tests with their databases? 
then I'm, I'm pretty sure you know that problem that you have like this one relationship that you want to test something with, but in order to create a customer, you have to create, I don't know, an address. And in order to store the address, you have to create a city. And in order to create the city, you have to insert a country into your database. And all this stuff that you don't really care about. If you have deferred constraints in your database, and you only use IDs in your application, you can just pretend the customer references the address number 23 without ever creating address number 23. Because in the test, you probably never commit. You just store it in the database. You query it. You look if everything works out as you want. And then your test ends, and a rollback happens. And uh, nothing gets, gets ever written to the database. So you lose a whole lot of complexity in your application. You even can decide to store the, um, the other aggregate root or the other aggregate in a totally different database. You can even store it in a different uh, kind of database, like have part of your model in uh, JDBC in a relational database, um, and some other stuff is in a Mongo database whatever fits your needs. So I think by really making these boundaries between aggregates stronger than they are currently are in most applications is really something that might improve many applications. Oh, also, one thing from my personal past, if you work with legacy code, like the real old stuff, like 30 years out, I would love if I could see aggregates there and say like, okay, I'm now just dealing with this aggregate, moving it to a new platform, and leave everything else alone. Um, so this kind of separation might become really, really uh, valuable. So that's the state right now. Um, we probably will at some time like add some syntactic sugar to allow easier conversion between entities and their IDs, this back and forth, which you right now have to do manually. Um, but that's still open to, uh, for discussion. So let's go real quick through a couple of more features of Spring Data JDBC that it currently offers. Uh, we have events. Um, I don't think anything special uh, about the choice of events. Um, before and after accessing a database, basically, um, including after uh, entities get loaded. Um, what might be interesting is, in these events, you, just, you don't just get like a reference to the entity that the event is about. You get, at least for the events that write to the database, you get an object called aggregate change. And that aggregate change is basically an abstraction over what we are going to do with the database. And the central part of it is a mutable list of database actions. And a database action represents a single SQL statement that we are going to execute. And inside an, um, on, okay, a single SQL statement, to clarify that, there's no like SQL string in that action object. It's more on an abstract level, like delete all addresses for a single customer, and then the ID of the customer. And in these events, you can do everything you want, pretty much, everything Java allows. Um, to be clear, this is very different from JPA, where you can't really access the entity manager. Um, you really are not supposed to edit other entities, although it might work. Interesting wording in the specification there. Um, with Spring Data JDBC, do whatever you like. You can access the database. You might call the repository, although you have to watch out to not end up in an infinite recursion. Um, change the entity. You can even change the aggregate change and like remove database actions or add database actions. Um, to be honest, this part of the API is, it will evolve in the future because I have currently no idea how you are going to use it. 
And I'm pretty sure you will find stuff that you think like, this should work, but it doesn't. Um, but I think it might be um, really powerful eventually. There's a simple example in the Spring Data examples uh, demonstrating it um, like uh, by implementing a simple form of uh, soft deletes. So deletes get replaced by an update, which just set a flag to true and um, this kind of thing. Then we have auditing. If somebody gets excited, yeah, I can get rid of Envis. No, not that kind of auditing. It's more about these four fields that almost every database has um, almost every table uh, created at, cr uh, modified at, created by, and modified by. To fill these, uh, all you have to do is, in your application context, add an enable JDBC auditing, and then in your aggregate route have uh, attributes like these. The important part is the annotation, not the name of the, of the attributes. And we fill those uh, for you. Um, obviously, for who created an entity or an aggregate, we need a source for that information, which would be a bean of type auditor aware. Um, a trivial implementation could look like this. Um, but you probably get something from Spring Security or something, which gives you the current registered users. Then we have my batches. That's actually really interesting for me. Who is using my batches? That are quite some people. Good thing. Um, when I presented this kind of stuff in Germany, there's like four hands going up all together in like six Java user group meetings. Um, was kind of disappointing. Uh, because I think I do like my betis. I think it's a nice tool. And what we currently do with it is I mentioned the database actions, which like uh, describe all the SQL statements that we need to execute against the database. Um, we basically um, deduce from the type of database action a name and look that up in the as a SQL statement in the my betis session. And if we find a statement, we use that statement instead, instead of whatever Spring Data JDBC um, creates by default. It needs a little more uh, setup, um, so I won't go through it um, today. But again, there's an example for this in the Spring Data examples. Then we have the query annotation, really straightforward. You add a method to your repository, you slap a query, add query annotation on it, uh, write a SQL statement in it, and whenever you execute that method, we will execute that SQL statement. If you want to use it to update or delete stuff, um, just add, a, add modifying, and we will handle that as well. There was a question? Currently not. I'll say a little thing about that later. Oh, the question was if I can put the query string somewhere else, like in a property file. And the answer is currently no. What you can do is uh, you can specify your own row mapper if you don't like the stuff that we do by default. Um, which already brings me to like, what are we planning? The people that know Spring Data probably missed a couple of features that they kind of expected. And um, well, there's still plenty of stuff to do. One thing I would like to do um, is to do better CRUD operations. Um, we are somewhat inefficient uh, right now. I'm doing like deleting all the stuff to uh, reinsert it afterwards. There's a lot of actually rather simple uh, potential for improvement. Um, we're going to tackle that. Then one of the most requested features um, I also get, got asked, like, how could you possibly release this without this feature, which I, uh, might not be that important. But anyway, we will uh, provide derived queries uh, 
that is the um, popular feature of Spring Data where you just uh, add a method to your repository, like find by name, and we look, okay, the entity has a name property, so you probably want to do effectively a select star from customer where name equals whatever you provided as a parameter. Um, this will most likely come in the next version. Um, then there's sorting and paging, which we unfortunately currently do not support. Um, the reason being the SQL standard, or actually the creative interpretation of uh, the SQL standard, um, meaning every database um, implements like limit clauses uh, totally different, and it's um, still surprisingly un uh, unfun work to implement that, but I get, guess I have to get through that. Of course, we also take pull requests, and I really would love one for that. Um, then one thing I think about is name queries for my betas, um, which could be a, an answer uh, for, the, for what you mentioned, um, basically externalizing queries to my betas, um, but also my betas already has features similar to that, so I'm not completely sure if that uh, makes sense for repositories. One thing we will probably do is uh, to allow queries to be stored in property files because that's also supported by other modules, so it kind of plays with the idea to make the modules similar in their, their range of features as far as possible. Um, then Spring Boot support is still here because um, I didn't want to change my slides more than necessary, and technically it's only a milestone release. Um, so when 2.1.0 comes out, uh, we will have official and supported support for um, Spring Boot or Sp Spring Data JDBC in Boot. And then the question, which is, I guess, kind of superfluous for this talk, since you probably all saw it on, in the keynote, um, the question I, up to now, always got asked, like, how about reactive support? And just to reiterate real quick, the problem is JDBC is blocking, and reactive inherently means non-blocking. You kind of can get around that by like hiding your JDBC access code behind a thread pool, but that's really kind of putting lipstick on a pig. It doesn't really solve the, the real problem. Um, so what we need is um, a reactive API for accessing databases first. Um, also, some people want to put that on JPA, which doesn't work at all. Even if we get a replacement for JDBC that is reactive under the hood, the, like the style of working JPA is basically you load a fairly big graph of objects into memory, you manipulate that, and when you're done, you store it in the database. That is like a rather big chunk of work that you try to handle in one go, which is great for many applications, but doesn't really fit the, the idea of reactive, where you more have the idea like you have an event, you do like a small piece of work, and then handle control, give control back um, to the infrastructure so that things can uh, keep moving. And as Oliver already mentioned uh, this morning, Oracle came up with ADBA. The first announcement was like two years ago. Uh, last year, they got a little more serious, and it actually looked really promising in the start, like at first glance, because they had reactive stuff in there. But um, on closer inspection and discussion with the, with the Oracle team on the mailing list, um, it became clear they have no intention to actually make it reactive. What their goal seems to be um, is to make it async, which is nice, but it isn't reactive, and you like can't fix that by by some kind of, of proxy. You get basically back again to this uh, thread pool solution, and um, so there's like one thing that gives a little hope, 
there was a, I think it was in San Francisco, a Java user group uh, meeting where a couple of people actually could start discussing with Oracle guys face-to-face, uh, -face, and it sounded a little like they are, they are seeing the light um, and might realize that they have to do uh, really a reactive API. And as Ben said uh, before lunch, that would actually be the best solution if like Oracle comes together with a community app with a real reactive API that is really nice. Um, I think that would be the best for the Java community. Anyway, for now, that is, doesn't look like it's going to happen. Um, if you want to play with ADBA anyway, um, there's uh, ADBA over JDBC, which is a demo application not intended for productive use. Um, it's just so that you actually can use the API for something and see like how it feels and maybe give feedback on the mailing list. So since everybody who cares about Reactive was kind of disappointed about the ADBA, um, R2DBC got created um, with a GitHub re uh, repository and organization and as I learned today in a keynote, a proper URL as well. And there are many people working on that. It's not just a pivotal thing. I mean, pivotal is strong in this one, um, but there are other people involved like uh, Lucas Eda with us, um, an immense background uh, and knowledge about uh, databases. Um, David Carnock, um, creator of Rx Java, um, is involved and looks at this stuff and gives feedback. Um, so I think the, like the, the community support is much broader um, with RD, uh, R2DBC than it is with ADBA. Um, as far as implementations go, there are currently two. One based on Postgres, which is currently the only a uh, somewhat relevant database that ha offers a reactive driver. Um, and there is an implementation based on ADBA, which is kind of our, our hand reaching out to Oracle, like we still want to talk to you. Um, we are not eager to like um, have two APIs when we really would be better off every, um, with just a single one. Which Brings us back to the original question, like what about support for reactive stuff uh, for relational databases in Spring Data? Um, the current state is there is something for, for demonstration purpose in a branch and um, enough to play around with, certainly not to use it productively. It's just a happy path implementation right now. Um, we are certainly going to push that further and keep developing that. And um, essentially, we want to have something like maybe at the time of the next release, which probably happens mid next year. But since we can't promise that and we don't want to bind us uh, to it by like having an early milestone, including it and then pulling it out later on, um, it will probably not be part of the release train, but like come with a separate release which allows us to release it uh, later or maybe even earlier, um, whatever happens in that area. So a lot of interesting stuff going on there. So if you want to play with Spring Data JDBC, um, these are the uh, resources you should look at. Um, there are also two articles I wrote in the last two weeks, I think, on uh, the Spring I.O. blog, um, which basically describe what, sh what I uh, showed you um, in this talk. If you want to know who talked the whole time in this awful German accent, um, that's me. Um, and you also find the slides uh, behind this URL. If you have questions, my clock says we have actually almost five minutes left. 
So I can take some questions now. Any other questions? I will be in front of the room afterwards so you can ask me more. So there's a question. Um, yeah, so um, to, to repeat and um, condense what you just said, um, I complained a little, actually I guess a lot, about JPA. And uh, some of the complaints don't really go against JPA, some go against the implementation. Um, also, uh, so some of the things uh, can be handled differently by uh, different ORMs. And also, if you don't rely on the specification, but go to the ORMs directly, some of them allow you to uh, do stuff or to basically fix stuff that I complained about, although the, then you are um, outside of JPA. All this is absolutely correct. Um, no doubt about it. Um, also, you suggested that uh, one could um, address these issues in the uh, specification and um, like to Im improve the specification of JPA to solve these issues. Um, a couple of things about that. While it is true that you can like fix all these uh, issues um, one way or the other with one ORM or the other, you then code against one specific ORM and you are using it in like an edge configuration, like not the standard configuration, and it still is a very complex beast, much com more complex than I, li I like it uh, to have. Also, um, like evolving the JPA specification, um, I'm all for that. I'm actually willing to contribute that. I actually have open issues against the JPA specification. Unfortunately, in the past, there was like no movement at all for many years. Um, now this is changing. We just like last uh, week or so got the, the TCK uh, source code so we can actually see the tests that are used to verify specification implementations. But all this stuff is moving really, really slow. Although at least it starts moving. And also by like starting fresh, dropping all this baggage, I think we have uh, an, an interesting thing at hand um, that actually uh, will prove valuable. Although I certainly admit it will contain bugs, it is limited, it is a 1.0 implementation, um, so it will take some time. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to tune that to do a join? Um, that is actually part of uh, what I mentioned, uh, like improving the CRUD query, uh, doing a join uh, in that situation um, uh, is one of the, the improvements. Um, I think there, there will be many more and for like a long time to come. <laughs> 
Um, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question again. So the question was, is there a way to like tune the SQL statements that are used? Um, there is some uh, amount that you can do with like uh, the MyBetis uh, integration I mentioned. Um, uh, some of the stuff you can do by that. Um, I think the like doing a join at that place with a own row mapper that or the MyBetis row mapper if it uh, um, does that out of the box that should be possible. Um, it uh, you always also have always the option to like uh, write custom implementation, the feature I didn't uh, mention explicitly, but you always can like provide your implementation of a method and just have the repository as a wrapper. That is always an option. Um, tuning the like having 90% of the statements generated by Spring Data JDBC, but tuning some others. Um, it's really difficult so, um, to come up with a uh, usable API to do that. Um, if somebody has ideas how we could like, allow that uh, to happen, um, I'm really interested in, uh, interested in discussing that. Um, but so far, it's, uh, it's limited on that uh, side. My bait is, seems to be the best option to look at. OK. Oh, in the, in the add query annotation. OK, the question was um, in the example for add query, um, I used select start to uh, make the query short enough so it uh, uh, fits on the screen. Um, normally, you would, would never ever use select star. We all know that. You put in all the columns. But on the other hand, you don't want to put in all the columns because that is just lengthy and boring and hides what you really want to do. There's actually an issue in, in Jira already where you basically um, like uh, just provide the where clause of your query, and we basically uh, prepend it with a select of all columns. So right now, no, but there's an issue, and it should be fairly easy to implement. So it's not high on my priority list, to be honest, but if I get a pull request, uh, I find time to merge it in. Do I have to say that more often? Um, right, uh, um, eventlessness that write the, the data um, that you need in a, in a separate database. That, that actually should be fairly straightforward. I, I don't foresee any problems with that, although I'm not really great at overseeing this kind of stuff. Any more questions? OK. Um, the question is, is there any um, option for other ways to generate IDs? Um, currently, the other option you have is uh, to manually create your IDs. That is, um, implement an event listener and um, just create an ID um, like before a save event. Um, that is certainly something we would need to add eventually to have like uh, uh, simpler ways to, to do that. OK. I'm actually over the time now. Kind of missed that. Um, so any more questions? I will be outside. Thank you. <laughs>